Wow! I, I have to say, I am so excited to be here because it seems like everyone is so excited to be here tonight. There's such a great energy in this room. Thank you. I am Carol Nixon. I'm editor and publisher of Milwaukee Magazine, and I am proud to present the second annual Unity Awards. I'm so excited for you to meet our awardees and hear their thoughts on how we can make the city, let me take this off, a more inclusive place for all. So I, my, I'm going to keep my comments very brief. We have a lot to get to tonight, and mostly I want to save the spotlight for the Unity Award honorees. But before I do that, I want to pay a little attention to our sponsors who made all of this possible tonight. Our presenting sponsor, Coles. Our gold sponsors, Quad, Molson Coors, and I have to say Molson Coors provided the complimentary beer and beverages, so. and Church Mutual Insurance. Our silver sponsors, Myad. Grafe, and Associated Bank. And our supporting sponsors, Aeon and the Coalition. Sorry, you guys. I didn't mean to run right past you. And the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families. Thank you all. Okay, one housekeeping note, we have these signs around saying that you, your presence constitutes your consent to be photographed, tape recorded, and uh, I don't know what else, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, there's, the sign is there, it's also on the back of the program, and if you don't want to be photographed, videotaped, and whatnot, um, we have to ask you to leave the premises, but please don't. <laughs> So, you know, bringing people together like this for an open exchange of ideas is a crucial part of Milwaukee Magazine's mission, and it feels so good to do it in person again after all these two years. Over the last two years, we've seen a renewed focus on equity and justice for the BIPOC community as well as the LGBTQ community. And in a city that has the shameful distinction of being, by some measurements, the most segregated city in the United States, I am particularly proud of the individuals and organizations working to bring us all together. In the spirit of unity, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our sympathy and solidarity with the people of Ukraine. I think we are all awestruck by their courage in fighting for their freedom and for their homeland. Let's keep them in our thoughts and prayers. Okay, so we are going to start our program with a land dedication. I'd like to introduce Starla Thompson, a member of the Forest County Band of Potawatomi and an indigenous consultant. Welcome, Starla. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Carol, for that introduction. Um, Buju, Waban Gija Kwe knows one. Gede de Nadodam, Esigna Mawak, Nadonjaba, Elsie Johnson, Nakomis, Bodwad Mi Kwe, Anishinaabe Kwe, and Dao. And what I said was um, my English name is Starla Thompson. My spirit name translates to the first light that breaks the night woman. I come from the Otter Clan of the Forest County Potawatomi and Santayana Chumash Nations, and my grandmother was Elsie Johnson from Stone Lake, Wisconsin. So um, the introduction I provided is an integral part of our oral tradition, which keeps, um, protects and keeps our culture and history as Native American people. 
This history tells us that we are the Anishinaabe, or original people, and as the original people of this land and the original stewards, we carry a sacred responsibility and relationship with the land. Land acknowledgement is an indigenous way of life practiced for time memorial. In our traditional teachings instill within us humility, gratitude, and reciprocity with the knowledge that we are the last beings of creation. As creator's most pitiful beings, we understand that we need all other orders of life for survival, including land. The land is a source from which clans, food, medicine, plants, and sacred places. Our homelands, which include Manenawak or Milwaukee, the Great Lakes region, hold a deep connection to creator. This connection provides lessons for sustaining that sacred relationship and a roadmap for living in accordance with all of creation. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the lands that we live, learn, and work are the traditional homelands to the Bad River, Lake Superior, Chippewa, the Ho-Chunk Nation, the Lakota Ray Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa, the Lacta Flambeau Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa, the Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin, the Oneida Nation, the Forest County Potawatomi Nation, the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa, St. Croix, Chippewa, Sokagon, Chippewa, the Stockbridge Muncie Nation, and the Brothertown Indian Nation, along with many others that were forcibly removed. The fact that indigenous people have endured and continue to act as stewards is a remarkable act of perseverance. So it is with gratitude and intentionality we honor the relationship indigenous people have with the land, and not just with our words, but in action. Therefore, I invite you to stand with indigenous people as caretakers of Mother Earth for the benefit of our future generations. Miigwech, thank you so much. Thank you, Starla. We are very honored to be in this beautiful space tonight. Here to tell us a little bit more about Latino Arts Inc. and the United Community Center is Jacoba Lovo, which I've been practicing all day and I just stumbled over. Give me one more chance. Jacobo Lovo, Ma Managing Artistic Director. Hello everybody, my name is Jacobo Lovo. And it is my privilege to be the Managing Artistic Director here at Latino Arts. I see that as a privilege to be able to serve my community in this capacity. Uh, and it's really, truly a blessing. I also want to say thank you to all the sponsors that made this evening possible, and of course, to Milwaukee Magazine. And in a sense, more importantly, to all of you who are gathered here to celebrate unity. So thank you so much. With that in mind, I want to invite all of you to connect with Latino Arts so you can learn a little bit more about our mission which is to preserve and conserve the cultural heritage of the Latino community here. However, we have a parallel part to that mission, which is to build cultural bridges through that cultural programming, to invite non-Hispanic folks to connect with our community, and through that, build a more united United States, and one community at a time. So thank you all. So how do you stay connected? To learn about the amazing exhibit next door, Carlos Barberinas, I have been a stranger in my own land and our upcoming exhibit, which is titled, Familias Unidas, a tribute to migrant workers in Wisconsin in 1960s and 1970s. By the way, Carlos Barberina's exhibit is on view through March 11th, and our next exhibit, Familias Unidas, will open on April 8th, the same night where we have Quetzal joining us, literally going to rock the house on this stage. <laughs> so if you want to revisit this space, but not sit down and maybe get up and dance a little bit, Join us back here on April 8th for Quetzal. So how do you stay connected? We are on social media at Latino Arts Inc. across the board. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it. We are there as Latino Arts Inc. And you can, of course, visit our website to learn more about our upcoming programming at latinoartsinc.org. Thank you all. Congratulations to all the honorees tonight and enjoy the rest of the evening.
We are very grateful to our presenting sponsor, Coles, for their generous support of tonight's event. Please help me welcome Samantha Maldonado, Senior Manager, Diversity and Inclusion, Coles. Samantha. I have heels on, so I'm taller today. How is everyone doing? We're good? Awesome. Well, I just want to say hello and welcome everyone to tonight's 2022 Milwaukee Magazine Unity Awards. I am extremely honored to be here with you this evening, especially now we can socialize and be in the same physical space again. My, as, as Carol mentioned, my name is Samantha Maldonado. I am proud to be the Senior Manager of Diversity and Inclusion at Coles. Coles is committed to supporting important d &I initiatives and especially those in our hometown Milwaukee community. The push for diversity, equity, and inclusion has dominated more headlines in recent years, but there is still a lot of work to be done, and we are taking up that mantle. It's work that will take time, but it must be a priority. That's why it's such an honor tonight to recognize the individuals and organizations in our community who have invested their energy, talent, and resources to make our city more equitable and inclusive for all. I'm proud to work for Coles, where we are dedicated to championing diversity and then listening, learning, and then acting with intention to help be part of the solutions that enable all of our people to be their authentic selves. That's why Coles has really accelerated our DNI strategy with our pledge for progress, centered around our people, our customers, and our community. It means embedding DNI throughout our business and holding ourselves accountable with measurable goals and results. Understanding and embracing DNI is not just the right thing to do. It's critical to our workplace, our customer experience, and the future of our company. Different backgrounds, cultures, and perspectives make all of us better and stronger. You can learn more and read our Pledge for Progress at Kohl's.com. The Milwaukee community is Kohl's home base, so I know we're all looking forward to this evening's panel discussion featuring this year's Unity Award winners. Each and every one of you represent DNI efforts that we're all committed to. So this year's winners are making a difference by helping Milwaukee's displaced and homeless LGBTQ youth, offering housing, counseling, health care, training, and family support, young professionals and local businesses as they work to address racial inequity in our area, AAPIs in our community striving to celebrate Asian culture and cultivate awareness about issues of hate and racism, our Milwaukee youth teaching our kids about diversity and race relations through the artwork of beautiful murals, more than 80 local communities, causes, organizations, and events celebrating with thousands of LED lights on the Hone Bridge, which I'm sure and hope you have all seen. <laughs> Latino artists providing a platform for women and non-binary people of color to collaborate and share their art with our community. When we see all of these efforts celebrated together, it's impossible not to be inspired and feel proud to call this city home. We're all in this together and have a shared goal to build a stronger, more inclusive Milwaukee. Thank you for joining us and congratulations to all of the 2022 United Award winners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. Here on behalf of Quad, our gold sponsor, I'd like to introduce Jenny Kent, Executive Vice President, Chief People and Legal Officer. Thank you, Carol. As Carol said, I'm Jenny Kent. I'm Chief People and Legal Officer at Quad. And I'm honored on behalf of Quad to be here tonight to celebrate all of you and all of the extraordinary things that are happening across Milwaukee to advance and promote unity. Thank you to Milwaukee Magazine for shining a light on today's honorees. Unity, by definition, is multiple elements coming together to create a better whole. And that's a principle that we believe in in Quad. Since our founding more than 50 years ago, we have been on a journey to create a better way for our employees, our clients, and our communities, with a vision to contribute as a society to a society in which we can do more together than we can do as individuals apart. 
This begins within, within our own walls at Quad, where we are working to foster an inclusive environment so that our employees can bring their most authentic selves to work every day. Together with Milwaukee's own Deanna Singh and Justin Ponder uh, and their team from Uplift, the Uplifting Impact, we are rolling out allyship training across our company to embrace and embody the change we want to see in our communities. This work also extends to our partners like Running Rebels and the Brand Lab here in Milwaukee. They're having a meaningful impact in our community and on, our, on Milwaukee's workforce to address the racial employment gap within Milwaukee and to create new opportunities for success amongst racially, ethic, ethnically, and economically diverse talent. Quad's work also encompasses our environment where we take seriously our role as a corporate citizen, but not just contributing economically, but caring for our planet and for our people. Our work is far from over and we have a long way to go, but we are fully committed to this journey at Quad and take great inspiration from all of you tonight. So thank you again for making Milwaukee such a strong and vibrant community and congratulations again to the honorees. Thank you, Jenny. Representing Church Mutual, a gold sponsor, please welcome Pam Stampin, Senior Vice President, Chief People Officer. Cherokee elder was teaching his grandchildren the story and the origins and important things in life. He said to them, there is a fight going on inside of me. It's a terrible fight. It's between two wolves. One wolf is evil. He is fear, anger, envy, sorrow, regret. He's arrogance, resentment, superiority, and ego. The other wolf is good. He's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, kindness, empathy, generosity, faith, and unity. The same fight is going on inside of you and everyone, he said to the children. The children thought about it for a minute and said, Grandfather, which will win? Which wolf will win? He simply said, the one that you feed. I'm so happy and pleased and blessed to be in a room full of people and award winners that have fed their better wolf and are here with us tonight. As the introduction said, I'm Pam Stampin. I'm the Chief People Officer with Church Mutual, and I do feel so fortunate to be representing Church Mutual at the Milwaukee Magazine Unity Awards. From humble beginnings in Merrill, Wisconsin over 125 years ago, our mission has been to protect the greater good and improve the human condition. By, by offering specialized products for purpose-driven organizations that serve others and inspire. In that spirit, we've committed to advancing equity inclusion both in our company and in the communities that we call home. We've built strategies that enhance our inclusive workforce for people of all backgrounds and beliefs, and we're creating a culture where everyone can thrive. To foster this positive change in our home state, Church Mutual has founded the Toward One Wisconsin Inclusivity Conference, a forum dedicated to building communities of equity and opportunity. Church Mutual has also proudly served customers in the greater Milwaukee area for a long time, but we've only recently opened our doors to our new office located in downtown Milwaukee, actually as of February 1st. As a new member of the Milwaukee community, we're excited to be part of this amazing, vibrant, and diverse community and to give back to the Milwaukee community as well. As a graduate of Riverside High School myself, um, I'm really excited to be part of Milwaukee again and part of the Church Mutual Milwaukee office and really excited to call Milwaukee home and be back with us. Milwaukee benefits from all of our gifts. Whether our gifts are providing housing to LGBTQ plus youth, or working in local business to address racial inequity, or elevating the visibility of AAPI peoples in the greater Milwaukee area, or sending messages of social justice through art, 
or turning a section of infrastructure into a message that conveys love and caring through color, or creating art to represent your Latina roots while controlling your own story and narrative. All of our United Award winners this evening bring us their gifts. We are thankful for them, and we are thankful for all of you. And thank you for having Church Mutual here tonight. Thank you, Pam. That was very beautiful. Okay, so now it's time for the panel discussion, and not a moment too soon because I can hear they are getting rowdy back there in the green room. It's like, I don't know what's going on, but it sounds fun. Um, okay, we have Pardeep Singh Kalika, Executive Director, Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee, and a 2021 Unity Award honoree tonight, moderating our panel discussion. Please help me welcome him and the 2022 Unity Award honorees. All right. Good afternoon, good evening. Sashigal, Namaste, Salam, Shalom, greetings. You all look beautiful. Please help me welcome to the stage the 2022 Award, Unity Award winners for tonight. Tonight is definitely a celebration. We are celebrating, it's been two years since I feel like a lot, of, a lot of people have been together in person, enjoying each other's company. Tonight we're gonna to talk about connection, community, what makes Milwaukee great, and just know that as we speak about all the things that make Milwaukee great, you are definitely a part of it. So tonight, after tonight, we'll talk, we'll meet everybody, We'll. We'll gather in the other room, and we'll get back to drinking some more wine. All right? <laughs> and some beer. And some beer. And maybe something else a little bit later. But drive safe. <laughs> All right. So uh, my name is Pardeep Kalika. Uh, I am honored to jo be joined by everyone on stage tonight. Can I pull this? There we go. All right, and first, uh, we're gonna do some just quick introductions, and then we're gonna get right into the conversation. To my left is Videl Hill. He is a professor, an artist, an artist educator, and a developer. Yeah, let's give it up. Just, uh. Yes, yes. And next to Videl is Katie Avila Lockmiller. She is the founder of Luna which is Latinas, Unidas, and Las Artes. Welcome. <laughs> Jessica Boiling, co-founder of Elevation and AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin, and now the new Assistant Deputy Director of WIDA. <laughs> big thing, big thing, okay. <laughs> Corey Joe Biddle, Vice President of Community Affairs for the, uh, for the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce and Executive Director of Fuel Milwaukee. All right, and next to Corey is uh, Jean Northway and Miosha Jackson, Program Director and House Supervisor at Courage House. And bookending us uh, will be Michael Halstead and Ian Abstin, co-founders of Light the Home. <laughs> we love y'all, okay? It just feels like you're far away now. It's like, <laughs> we'll bring you closer. Um, so, without further ado, let's start with the first question. I think this, this is a question of kind of for everyone. And everyone's kind of from different places of Milwaukee. I know we got 
lots of people in here who are either from Milwaukee, uh, from the state of Wisconsin, outside of Wisconsin, but we made home from in Milwaukee. I came to Milwaukee when I was six years old. I was just telling Ian I came here from India, Punjab, and we made home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. For those that don't know India, India is very warm. And so one of the things that I'm always like, why Milwaukee? <laughs> why not a warmer place? But now, you know, what is it, 30, 40 years later, and I'm like, I know why Milwaukee. Aww. So. So first question for everyone on stage is really, we know about the reputation of Milwaukee. And we know the reputation that it has for inclusion, thinking about segregation, historical segregation. What is the relative, what, what, how do you all feel, um, and for the relative newcomers, when you, when you came to Milwaukee and sort of the expectations from what you saw? And then for those that have been here for a while, could you all discuss whether you think the reputation is fair, or is there some other nuance that we're not discussing? So yeah, right. Vidal, you go first. Don't ask me that first. All right. <laughs> so when I got here, I was born. <laughs> and what I quickly realized is the reputation is absolutely true. Um, after traveling, once I became an adult and an artist, and traveling to show work, uh, courtesy of my lady Cynthia who helped me uh, in my uh, art career, I realized very quickly that our um, segregation issue is huge. Our resource and um, opportunity gaps are immense. The canyons. And that's why I do the work I do, is not only because I read about it or studied it, it's because I lived it, I felt it, my stomach grumbled, when I was hungry, I didn't read about it. Um, I lived on the street when financially things didn't work out for my family. So it's immense. And I've seen people do very well, and that was it. <laughs> Literally, that's, that's what happened. They were born doing well, and the next generation does well. And what I'm trying to do through my work is not be so bleak like my answer now but actually do the work so that it isn't so bleak for kids like me. So, yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess I'm still feel like a newcomer, although it's been almost uh, six years uh, coming up. And um, yeah, I'm from, I'm from Boston originally and kind of grew up on the East Coast and spent some time on the West Coast, and by a, a strange turn of events, I'm, I'm here in Milwaukee in the Midwest. It's not like the place I would like dreamed of when I was like little, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, but I, you know, and, I'll, and even my, fr my when I first moved here, I remember my friends and family being like, so you're going to a rural place with cows. And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> I've only ever lived in like, you know, major cities in the US. Like, so do you really, I don't think it'd be trading in that drastically. Um, but they really had no idea. It didn't actually even, and when I, and I still, when I go to other places, like I was in a residency in early 2020, um, and I remember giving a talk and being like, I think I have to actually place Milwaukee on a map for people because people don't realize where it is or even that we're like an hour and a half north of Chicago. And so people in the Midwest know, obviously, but the people on the coast were really, we're, you know, we are what we are. We think like the coasts are the only places that matters and like who cares about anything in the middle. Um, but I, when I got here, I was sort of blown away. I met Vidal in my first month of uh, moving to Milwaukee. And so that, he was my Milwaukee when I first moved here. And, and so I was just like, you know, and, and obviously I, you know, Vidal told a real story of what Milwaukee was like and how it was to grow up here and the, str you know, the struggles, um, just, you know, as he was speaking of, but also the resilience factor of, like, pushing through that. And there was a lot of people here who were making their own way here. Um, and so I really was influenced by that pretty early on because, um, to help with that and to, like, bring my own perspective, to continue to help others um, see that, that that was a possibility. So I think, um, you know, racism, segregation, 
it happens on the coast as well. I think uh, we like their, I think what I was actually, we were, we were speaking and I was like, I think Milwaukee just needs a better PR rep, right? So <laughs> at the end of the day, as uh, because it's a really diverse, um, really arts centered, culturally rich place, but it doesn't get that reputation and, and we, and all the bad things kind of come out about it. But, um, and you know, from the East coast, like I'm, again, I'm from Boston, pretty historically racist, segregated town too. Right. But like we rep hard for Boston and we are loud about it and we like, won't let anybody talk shit about it. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to say shit, but I did. <laughs> So yeah, so that's that's my feelings. Like, let's just let's just let people know and like let's rep our city. <laughs> so I'm one of those people that um, Katie's talking about. I didn't know where Milwaukee was on a map <laughs> when I heard that I was moving here. Uh, I grew up on the West Coast, Seattle. Yes, I'm a Seahawks fan. I will admit that. <laughs> um, and then went to school in Boston, actually. And when I found out that I was moving here, I was actually living in Seoul, Korea. And I was like, where are we moving? <laughs> what? And I had to look on a map and figure out where it was. My biggest concern was actually, where am I going to be able to find an Asian community? Because going to Korea and living in Korea was the first time I'd ever been in a majority. And um, it seems so small, but it was like one of the most validating experiences I've had in my life, just to see yourself reflected in commercials, in on boards, in everywhere. Just It was amazing. And so I was very worried about that moving here. And it was true. There were not a lot of, <laughs> a lot of Asians here. Um, and we had, I had to work to find them. Um, but we've created a really great group here. Um, and I feel like I'm still learning. I mean, I've been here eight years, a little longer than you. Um, but I feel like I'm still learning what Milwaukee is and how the racism shows up and how we can be more inclusive. So I'm still, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm still. I'm still learning and figuring out what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So I'm a Milwaukee native. Um, I've been here since I was like six weeks old. So I might as well have been born here. Um, and when, so I think about the first time that I was ever outside of the outside of Milwaukee is when I went to college. I went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, I know everybody's like, what? <laughs> I know, I know. It was, it, I was 14 when I made that decision, when I picked my college and I just followed through with it. But I really, I really wasn't aware of the community that I was, you know, it, it was a good experience for me in a, in a lot of different ways. It also helped me really appreciate Milwaukee because, you know, where I lived, the bus ran every 15 minutes. And in Tulsa, if you miss a bus, you're going to be standing there in the heat for an hour and a half. And there was just a lot of different contrasts that I was able to see once I came away um, from Milwaukee. The biggest kind, of, well, the biggest thing for me was like how seeing how other people see Milwaukee from outside of the city, right? So I'm in Oklahoma and I'm meeting people, and they automatically thought I was from the South because of my name. And apparently, we kind of sound Southern to other people here. Like if people from New York think we have a country accent in, in Milwaukee, I've heard that a lot. <laughs> but people kept saying once they realized that I wasn't from the South, and I was like, no, 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 I'm from I'm from Milwaukee. And like 80% of the time, they would look at me and then take a beat and be like, is black people in Milwaukee? <laughs> and it kept happening over and over and over and over. And, and so I finally started asking people, like, where is that coming from? Like, why do you think that there's no black people in Milwaukee? And they said, Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days. <laughs> and you think about that 70s show. So it just get, showed me the power of, like, media and perception about, you know, about a place. Now, absolutely, there's obviously tons of black people in Milwaukee, but I was able to contrast that with like what the real experience is, because you could live in Milwaukee and still, to some degree, not have relationship with people who don't look like you because of the segregation. Now, that said, there's tons of, you know, great things about Milwaukee. It's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful community, and there is something to be said for that feeling of, like, this is my city, and I rep for my city, and, like, dig in deep when it's time to face the challenges and I feel like there is a spirit of facing the challenges here and it battles with just like that historical segregation so I think that's why I stay here and that's why I'm hopeful because I do feel like 
folks recognize what the issues are, but they also have this love and this passion to, um, you know, help change it and turn it around. Kind of similar. I'm also a Milwaukee native. Um, similar. Um, I didn't really experience what Milwaukee really was until I like left. Um, I only, I went to Oshkosh, which is like we're still in Wisconsin, but like it was like so many different perceptions and so many different things going on. Um, I didn't realize what was really kind of happening to me. Um, when I went into college, I realized that there was a lot of different things about me that uh, veered people t away from me in my own state, and that kind of made me mad um so a lot of uh, my years were like spent being upset and not knowing how to fix or not knowing how to um represent myself in a proper way where people can hear me and not just see me for what they think they see me as um i i live my life walking as a black woman as a queer woman as a um disabled woman i guess like there's a lot of different things to me and i didn't think that people really like saw me um once i was able to like go back into my city because i knew it was important for me to come back because i don't see people in my position that look like me or that have that same type of background as me um once i started going back and talking to the kids about what i do or like helping them i realized how important it was for me to come back for a little bit do i feel like this is my forever place no um but it started who i am as a person suburbs and so I have a really just a different perspective and I think the more that I learn the more I just realize how limited my perspective was and still is um, I've lived in I love Milwaukee now we live in the city of Milwaukee I love living in the city of Milwaukee I love that we get to um, our family tries to be really intentional about where we're going and different neighborhoods we're going to and that it's easy I've lived in Chicago and it can be really difficult to go from one area to another. And I like in Milwaukee that you can go from, you know, one neighborhood and then we want to say, oh, we want authentic Mexican food. All right, that's 10 minutes away. Okay, we want some soul food. Okay, that's 20 minutes away. Okay, we want this. And it's a lot easier to get to. Um, so as I just continue to learn more and more about all the systemic issues that just feel so consistent and you know both see hope and just um the weight of it all tr we try to be really intentional about where we're going so it's the choice that we have in that matter uh i grew up in uh rural washington county uh to i claim to be the only two liberal parents uh in that county <laughs> uh, which i'm very proud of um, I moved to Milwaukee in uh, 2001 uh, to take a job at uh, UWM. And I, I spent 14 years at UWM, so I, I, I left a very, you know, lily white uh, small town of about 7,000 people and moved into Shorewood and worked at UWM for 14 years. My bubble was Shorewood, the east side, maybe Whitefish Bay, a little bit of downtown. Um, and then I took a job at the Greater Milwaukee Committee, um, and uh, the GMC said, uh, you're going to run this neighborhood uh, initiative called Milwaukee United and get that started. And you're going to work with this really strong, incredible black woman named Tony Griffin, uh, who was instrumental in getting Detroit back up on its feet. She worked for Cory Booker uh, when he was the mayor of uh, Newark. Um, and so here's me and here's Tony. <laughs> working together on something uh, that was designed, a program that was designed to take the uh, prosperity that was happening in the downtown and spread it into the adjacent neighborhoods, uh, dealing primarily with segregation. 
And uh, I learned a lot through that process, but there was a moment in the project when, um, when, when the riots in Sherman Park happened. And uh, it was the morning after all of that, and I was sitting outside in my car, sitting outside the MMAC office for a meeting to talk about all of this, and Tony calls me from New York. And she says to me, Michael, I saw on the news what had happened, and I'm calling to see how you're doing. And it just hit me uh, so much that she was calling me to see how I was doing, and I just, I broke down and cried in the car. And I thought to myself, holy shit, I, like, if I were still at the UWM and still in my East Side bubble, I would have looked at what had happened in the newspaper or saw it on, on TV and would have thought, man, that's a bummer and gone about my day. In this case, I was now invested in my community and invested in these neighborhoods in a way that I never had been before. And so I will say that I think that, I mean, the segregation in our city is absolutely real. Uh, however, I think that all of us here and, and uh, uh, all of us here uh, are, are proud of our city and believe that we can and, and will do better. And so, um, I mean, if, if there's one great thing about Milwaukee, and there are many, it's the fact that two idiots could go and light a bridge <laughs> and, and not knowing anything of what we were doing, really, um, and, and unite people and bring people together and be sitting up here with you all. Um, that Milwaukee is accessible in that regard. People who are passionate and want to do things in this community and want to change this community can do that here. And I think that is the best thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how I claw back any credibility after you <laughs> lob me up there. Milwaukee has also an uh, incredible tattoo artist. Uh, these are, my, you'd look like this guy's had tattoos his whole life, but this tattoo came the day after we got the signed MOU. Not a damn dime was raised for the bridge, but he was so confident in the project, he threw the home bridge on his arm. It's true. <laughs> Marriage has never been better for my yeah. wife loves the tats. Uh, I grew up in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. You might know it for Road America, uh, Ostoff Resort. You vacation there. No one lives there. I graduated <laughs> with 50 people in my graduating class. So for me, Milwaukee was the big city. It was the win when you came here. I only visited for museums and Admirals games back in the day. We couldn't afford the box games. We went to IHL Admirals games. Uh, a line I heard from, I think it was Mark Marotta, uh, years ago at a panel, maybe similar to this. Um, and this has been spoken true through many of us. Uh, Milwaukee, there's only two types of people that don't love Milwaukee. Those that have never been here and those that have never left. The perspective... Uh, and I think we all feel that, because I went to Oshkosh, you went to Oshkosh, I lived out west, I've lived further out west, and I'm sick of hearing about traffic congestion and potholes, because we're often in Wisconsin uh, for vacations. We like to go to Mexican all-inclusive resorts in Mexico, or we'll follow the Packers on a road game and say we vacationed. But we've never indulged ourselves into another community. So we, every city has a lot of the issues that we have. Uh, but if you don't have the perspective of seeing those problems in other communities, you think we're the only city with them. So we've got, a, to Michael's point, it is a city you can roll up your sleeves, buy a piece of property and shape it, or get engaged with the community and, uh, and help support it. And that, I think, is something truly unique to Milwaukee. And our opportunities are also our problems. But I think we've got a room full of people here that say, yeah, we'll fix that together. And that's Milwaukee. perception that there are no black people in Milwaukee. <laughs> we need that PR rep. <laughs> so, yeah. Get on it. <laughs>
Okay, so this came up in an interview I did uh, this morning, and my answer was fairly simple, but poignant, which is art is the universal language. No matter where you're at on the globe, you express yourself through art. Rather dance, music, fine arts, creative writing, media, uh, cinema, whatever that art form is, you can express yourself. Whether there's a language barrier, gender, um, age gap, income, no matter your context, what your reality is, art is the only thing that translates through time, through culture, through language, through uh, even like understanding sometimes. And that's why I use it. It, it saved me absolutely. And I use it as a tool to get to someone who has a life that is so far from mine, that's the only way we can speak. Or someone whose life is like a, a reflection of mine and they can look at me and see themselves. And I use art as that tool to make good people. I don't use people to make good artists, I use art to make good people. Yeah. I mean, out of necessity, I had to learn how to do many things. I would love to just paint and be recognized for the work that I put out to the world to proceed. But I quickly understood that I could do more, so I should do more. And that's when I got in front of youth. That's when I got in front of kids who wouldn't listen to their teachers, their math teachers, their science teachers, and convinced them to do better in general because they respected the time that we spent just having real conversations while creating art. So that's where the education part came from, especially with youth, is like, this kid doesn't want to be here. Let me give them a reason to be here. So not through osmosis, but through <laughs> just being there, they could learn something. They'll, they'll, they'll pick up math skills through measuring this mural off. We got a 10 foot by 12 foot, let's do the math. If we're doing a foot by foot, like, I used my art skills to teach them math, science, history. Everything you make is going to be perceived from someone. You have to learn how people think outside of yourself. You have to go beside yourself to understand your audience. So I had those kind of conversations with our education. And then beyond that, um, I, the development came from my partner, Sarah. She's here. My partner, Lexi. How you doing? But like, we actually want to change the foundation of stability for artists. And we couldn't do the things we knew were right because we didn't have the platform. We didn't own the spaces. We didn't fund the programs. So how do you do that? We have to own, we have to develop, we have to program, we have to understand how uh, the financing worked for these things. And this was never my career goal. But it's a necessity for me to do the best thing I can do for my people, my community, is to learn these things so I can pass it on. I'm not trying to hoard it. I'm not trying to learn this skill set so I could be the one. I'm one of many, and I just want to give it out. I mean, I want to Robin Hood this time, man. I want to take it all <laughs> and give it to the people. That's why I'm learning as much as I can. That's why I wear so many hats, because I got to feel so many hats. Definitely out of the box of it. I can just speak with a lot of people. <laughs> uh, talk um, thank you so much. And, and Katie, uh, as you like, you've seen ours be a unifying force of love. Uh, and what are some ways that you address equity and inclusion to the arts? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess I feel like um, I've been telling the origin story of Luna for 
some time, uh, but probably not everyone knows it. Um, I was working for an arts uh, organization here in Milwaukee early on. Um, I moved here in 2016, so I want to say it was, yeah, early 2017. Um, and I was working on a project that was in five different neighborhoods in Milwaukee, all black and brown neighborhoods with all black and brown students. And um, we were t I was tasked to help them figure out how to hire artists. And I got the roster of artists that they would choose from, from the organization. And it was like basically all white artists. And I was, I just immediately was like something, this doesn't add up. Like what is going on here? This is like unacceptable. I will not show my students this roster of artists, so like figure it out. Um, and specifically, um, because there was like maybe one black artist, it might have been Videl. <laughs> but then, but there was also like, there was no, there was no Latinx artist and no Latina artist. And I was, and I'm Latina, and my, actually my co-worker at the time was too, who was the co-founder of uh, Luna, Gabriela Riveros. And um, I just was, so I said to my manager, like, well, where, where are all the artists of color? Where specifically are the, art, the Latina artists? And she said to me, they just don't apply for these things. And I said to Gabby, we don't? Because clearly we're here. So I got, you know, angry, got like, <laughs> and, um, got a, um, and Gabby is from here. She's um, raised in Milwaukee. And so I kind of turned to her. I'm like, I'm new here, but are we the only Latina artists in the city? And she was like, hell no. Like, so, so we just, um, yeah, so we, she, I was like, well, Find, like write every Latina artist that you know of, whether you know them or you don't, and then tell them to bring f a friend and let's see if we can like get together. Or, I don't know, is that a good idea? Maybe not, I don't know. I'm just not from here. Um, so we, <laughs> so, um, so, but we did and we got together and we, and I saw like, there was so many artists, but there was also, yeah, there was like, they weren't, um, it's not that they weren't applying for things, those things, they weren't, they didn't know about those things. So it's not enough to just be like, oh, I put a call out for a mural, or I put a call out for a thing, come find us. That is not enough, that is lazy. And, and it just, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you want, so what I thought with Luna is like, hey, so you can ignore all these individual artists, but you are damn not gonna like ignore like 30 of us. And people did it, right? People started like seeing us. We were like, we were literally like taking up space. We were having on our shows, and it felt also really exciting to not be the token in a show, to um, show our work and and do Latina shit if we wanted to, and and or not if we didn't. Um, one time we just were like, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna make a show about superheroes because we all like superheroes, <laughs> you know. So, um, and that was also like empowering, like us deciding the like narrative of like what we wanted to tell through our art. Um, so yeah, so I think, and then and now you know it's been in, like a crazy journey with Luna. It's now like a for-profit business. You can hire us. If you need something, let me know. Um, and but also like my duty, like my my uh, what I really am passionate about now is like not only do I want you to hire us, but to pay us well. Because what happened with Luna is that we were doing this thing because we were we were excited about it. We were excited to have shows. We were doing all this stuff for free. I was like probably working like a forty-hour job with Luna for free. I'm not doing that anymore because that's crazy. Um, because so I. And I, I am really in like I'm insistent on educating everyone, like not just like um, to hire artists, and then artists can do more than murals. Murals are great, but we can do a lot more things. I hope Fidel you said do the same. <laughs> and and that, but you also like pay us well, and don't pay us like, and don't stop with the like call for artists and doing all the contract work. I actually just responded to someone recently. They were like, hey, we want, like, we're doing this call for artists and, like, make up all the plans and then we'll choose our favorite one. I'm like, that's basically asking an accountant to prepare your taxes and then be like, okay, um, I'm actually going to go with another accountant. So just think about that next time you, like, want to work with artists or put out a call for artists. <laughs> We gotta fix the PR problem, and we gotta stop being lazy. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're gonna have some takeaways from this at the end, but you already uh, you got a head start. Uh, Jess, um, much of your work centers around minority groups being seen and heard. How is that important, and what are what are some of the challenges to that in Milwaukee? Softball. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is also like maybe the second event that I've been to yeah. since the pandemic, so still absorbing everything. Um, yeah, so I think like for a lot of when we're thinking of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, we're small, um, and then we're not very, we're, we are not seen. We're largely um, invisible. Um, when I came here, um, I really wanted to connect, and I kept running into my Elevation co-founders, Sherry Tran, Mainza Tao, and Eric Kennedy. And then we've decided that we're going to come together and, you know, talk about our experiences and um, and start sharing that with the community so we could be seen, because we really were realizing that we're left out of the conversations that were happening in Milwaukee about race, about um, about race and injustice that was happening. Um, a lot of that has to do with the data. Um, AAPIs are not seen as someone that, or as a group that faces disparities. We've been propped up as a model uh, model minority, um, and that's actually a tool that's been put together so to uh, a wedge to wedge us against other um, racists because they say if they can make it, then why can't you make it? Um, but if you take the data and you disaggregate it, because Asian APIs are not just one. We are many, um, and if you look at the data, you, we have people from South uh, South Asia, India. You have me from Korea. We have um, Hmong. We have also um, Burmese refugees coming here, and so you have a really diverse group. Um, but it gets lost in the data, and if you look at the data um, and you look at the, the disparities between different groups, we have some of the uh, um, um, some of the largest disparities go going on. Yet we don't get resources because it's hidden in the data, um, and so we need to just start showing up and like talking. But we don't have the numbers, and so a lot of us are usually the one and only in the groups, in our workplaces, in the communities. And so when we're bringing to, bringing in the group together, and then making sure that we we had a seat at the table, because at this point, APIs don't really have a seat at the table. So right now we're just fighting to get our voices heard, um, and that comes in numbers, and then it comes in like building an identity, and I think also feeling proud. For me. I didn't really go into it in my first um, in the first question because I was still th <laughs> still thinking things over I guess um, but I stay in Milwaukee because of because of the API group that we've um, made I, ha I feel stronger in my identity I feel more empowered because I have a community behind me I feel more pride in being um, AAPI mm -hmm. um, and I also agree with what everyone else has said too is that Milwaukee is an accessible city and that um, we do have a chance to make a change, and I think it's very important that we have these groups that are coming up, and you know, getting our voices and getting getting at the table, and now um, make, making changes. Thank you. For that. Thank you so much. And speaking about, I mean, and speaking of invisibility, on March 16, 2021, at the height of the pandemic, uh, eight women were shot and killed by a suspect. Six of them were Asian, and many people did not call that a hate crime. This is at the height of the pandemic, and it took all of the will to, from the AAPI community in Wisconsin to have legislators here in the state of Wisconsin recognize it as a hate crime. And so you had to, I mean, a part of like what we do is that stepping up and, and, and saying, hey, listen, this is what this looks like and feels like to our community. And you all did that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think, feels like, I think, I think back about the experience, it's, a, it's been almost a year. And I felt like our group felt like we we're being gaslit because people were saying it's not a hate crime. And I think a lot of people think APIs don't experience racism. Until the, until the pandemic came, I think people were like, oh, APIs don't, don't, don't face it. It shows up in a different way. And we've had to fight to ha be heard. That's exhausting. <laughs> it's hard. Um, and it puts me in a position, and our group in positions where we don't like it. I like to challenge people, to ask them to um, hear us, and stand up and um, listen to us. I think we, um, party concluded, um, put pressure on, had to, had to put pressure on the governor to listen to us and say, acknowledge, you know, this was a hate crime. We do hear you. But it took an ed education, and we are, you know, moving forward, and people are people are learning. But it's you know, it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work to get there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Corey, 
In your profile for the magazine, you said, it's not too late for any of us to shift our focus to greater equity and true community inclusion. First of all, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful statement, and I know that you do this through the, through the work that you do, but I, I wonder what are, some, what are some ways for all of us to do the work, for all of us to do the work towards that goal? I mean, I, I think it's events like this and conversations and relationships are just so important. A lot of the work that we've been doing through Fuel, I mean, our work has always been about community engagement and getting people together for events and having conversations. Um, historically, you know, Fuel is a community engagement group. It's always been young professionals for the most part. And maybe we would have been able to get away with having one or two conversations about segregation in Milwaukee or race relations and you know, once we got past that one or two, you could feel that people were like, okay, here we go with this again, or do we have to keep talking about race? Well, all of that completely changed um, with the murder of George Floyd. We started the webinar series um, and the race bridge conversations that were really designed to first talk about people's reactions and their feelings and just the trauma of what we saw happen um, to George Floyd and how we saw it affect our city, the community, I mean, the world, people really wanted to start to have conversations. I think we initially it was meant to be just cathartic. I thought we'll have a couple of these webinars and I was thinking, you know, one or two of them and then we got to move on to, you know, strategic planning or whatever, <laughs> something else that people want to talk about. But um, that opened up a window of opportunity for people to have exchange in our community in a in a different way. I mean, it happened in the, in the world. We saw it happen in the world, but I was closer to what I was seeing in Milwaukee and was able to contrast my experience with, like, people, you know, field members, mostly white folks, and their experience of Milwaukee is very different than the Milwaukee that even many of us up here are, have seen or been exposed to and the tolerance to have these conversations. Like, well, this is not really affecting me. But once it was in everybody's face, it, it opened up an opportunity for us to start having conversations. Initially, those conversations were about what happened to George Floyd, and then some uh, more basic conversations about, you know, bias and, you know, what is racism and, you know, what is inclusion. Until, you know, two years in, into it now, we're having conversations about the way that we relate to each other. Uh, Eric Kennedy, who was one of the other co-founders of Elevation, and I put together a Race Bridge webinar about um, anti-Asian sentiment in Milwaukee, which was like largely driven by COVID and you know our president's comments at the time. And that's, I mean, to this day, that's our most watched Race Bridge conversation. And we were able to talk about the idea of the model minority and how Asians have been kind of propped up as you know, able to assimilate, you know, financially, you know, prosperous, they're the ones. And if you can't do with what they did, then, you know, you're not, you're just not working hard enough. And the historical relationship between Asians and black people, where there is this love affair between our cultures, but there's also this really nasty side where, you know, there's this, this, this fighting and this, like, hate for each other. Now, how often do you get a chance to see a black person and an Asian person sit up and talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah. It was just, it, we all talk about it privately in our own homes, but we had the opportunity to like have this conversation and thousands of people have watched the conversation. And I'm really close to Eric and he helped me put together the panel. And I mean, just the power of like conversation, making friends, you know, Ashley, who wrote my article, we took an Uber here on the way. We talked about race and racism all the way here. I'm sure our Uber driver was like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> but you got to be able to talk about this and how it makes you feel and how it makes other people feel. And I mean, that's the only way that this works. That's the only way that we move forward. Relationship is everything. Yeah, thank you. So... This conversation can't stop tonight. This conversation needs to continue. Uh, these are the eight of the most accessible people that you can, uh, you know, kind of contact. If you, if you just, I mean, just 
just contact them, let them, like, hey, we want to have this conversation around uh, whatever is happening right now. If it's something that, that it's, it's affecting our hearts, it's affecting all of us. It's affecting our children. And so this is not, this is not simply just having conversation or doing art or doing other things for, for the sake of, and that's brilliant. That's fantastic. Let's do art for art's sake. Let's have conversation for conversation's sake. But this is about mental health. This is about spiritual health. This is about taking care of one another. We are coming out of two years of a pandemic. There's a lot of people who are hurting right now. Just look around. You, 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 like try to be there. Try to listen to them. Make them feel heard. Make, make them feel seen. So I think this doesn't stop tonight. This kind of continues, right? This work continues. Uh, Jean and Miosha, um, some of the work that you also do is on minority groups being seen and heard. How is that important for your group and uh, for your group? And what are some of the challenges that you all see in Milwaukee? Let me go first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean we're signing because it, obviously it's really complicated. Brad and Nick started the Courage House because they saw a big need for a home for teens who were LGBTQ and were kicked out of other places. And I think a lot of people had this idea about opening this home and what it would be like and this simple narrative that it would go through. And, oh, if we just allow kids a space to be themselves, right, that check that box, that's done and easy. And I think from the beginning, there were some of us who knew no this is gonna, it's a lot more complicated and um, have only learned through time how much more and more complicated it is that for some of the kids coming into our house, their gender identity or their sexual orientation is the biggest factor in their life. And they walk through the door and almost shed a weight, right, of oh, I can be myself. But for most of the kids, I would say it's not the biggest factor going on in their life. So now we say, okay, you can be, your, you can be yourself here, or you don't have to worry about being teased for your gender identity or sexual orientation. We have staff who just have a, a whole range of gender identities and sexual orientations, which, and you know, race and other identities, which is amazing. And then we can say, okay, we're here with you to try to figure out how to deal with all these other really, really complicated systems. And I think just even in the past week or two, we've really just felt a lot of weight of, okay, we're here for you and we're advocating and we're working with broken system upon broken system, even when we feel like these things are in place to say, these kids have some really significant mental health needs and you know, our county mental health resources are not set up to deal with that. Or this kid is in crisis. You know, we created our own team of crisis stabilizers because the county resources were just stretched too thin and people were coming in and, you know, 45 minutes, two hours after a crisis to say, oh, I'm here. Thanks. Is this still going on? Kids who need to go to the hospital and there's no mental, the behavioral health division is just full or they're gonna they don't have enough room to do any long-term planning so they're kicking kids back out in four hours or 24 hours there's no real treatment going on so I think that's kind of the thing that weighs heavy in all the staff hearts every day and is probably the biggest discrepancy between kind of how stuff gets painted or the hope of, oh, this, this magical, magical queer rainbow house, right? There's, there's some RuPaul and sunshine and, and rainbows and some glitter, right? But there's a lot of trying to figure out all these other things. I would have to say um, a lot of what I do personally, like not just what Courage does, but like what I do personally for the kids is just explaining what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like a lot of where I was lost or confused was like I didn't understand a lot of the things that was happening to me had names. I didn't understand a lot of what was going on was intersection, like intersectionality at, at its core. Like I didn't understand that. And a lot of the kids feel like I or anybody around them can um, relate because there's so many different aspects coming at them at once. But like 
I was you. Like, yeah, I feel you. Like, we can talk, we can sit down. Like, everything is not going to be easy. And once you're in the system, you're in the system. And it's hard for me to explain, like, um, there are ways out of it. But, like, if we keep not feeling like we're worth getting out of it, we won't get out of it. And, like, it, it's, hard, it's hard to explain that, like, our system is set up for us to fail, but there are other ways to get out of that. Um, and they are in the heat of always feeling like it's failed. Mm -hmm. So like, I just give them hope. I'm an emotional support animal. But like, <laughs> Thank you so much. This work is uh, exhausting sometimes. This work is, you know, at times it's like, you couldn't imagine doing something different. Um, it's it's something that we you know we, we need some hope we need some life um, it's all all of that all at once um, and I think uh, Michael and Ian um, thinking about the project and then really not not the project but the process of uh, putting lights on a bridge right generically putting lights on a bridge is what you did could you talk a little bit about the hope of that the, the difficulties of it, what was the inspiration when you felt down and didn't think like we, we'd be able to fill that bridge with lights? How much time do we have? <laughs> not, not long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I, well, I, do you want to start? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the the whole process was, what, almost five years from start to finish. Um, and it was, I think none of it was easy, I'd say. I mean, we, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, and I think that um, it wasn't until we really started asking for help that, that there are people in Milwaukee who know how to do these sorts of things. We just weren't two of them. We are now. Um, but. But at the time, you know, it was really difficult. And I think that we always had this vision in our head of what, I, I mean, I've, I've never worked on a project where I just had such a clear, I could just see it in my head, I think both of us. And I think that's why we kept, kept moving forward with it. And it wasn't just about a lit bridge and in addition to our, our nighttime skyline, it was, it was about what it could be more than that. And we always said from day one that it had to be about more than lights on a bridge. I mean, we're asking all of you to separate $25 from your bank account to buy a bulb to, to make this happen, or, or more. And, and so it was, it was more, just more. Um, but, um, you know, we now are seeing the reality, I think, of that come, come true in terms of this has really turned into a community asset. It, it you know, we, we lit for API uh, uh, when uh, that horrible tragedy happened a year ago. And it was because of Eric calling and saying, hey, we need to do something. And we said, all right, you know, we've got access to this giant billboard that is, is communicating things, it's bringing people together, it's teaching kids, um, it's, it's doing all of that. And I think that there were moments that were some really dark we, we I mean, there was like six months where not even our own parents donated to the project. And, and, you know, but we kept going. And there were a lot of really amazing people just with a hand at our back saying to keep going. And I think that's what's really special about our community in that regard is that, that we are supportive of one another. And so, yeah, I, I, yeah I'll let you speak now. <laughs> Michael. We've cried a lot together. I thought you were going to cry there for a second. Uh, I think a lot of people up here, I think everybody up here, you're, uh, we're starters. You see a problem in Milwaukee, you're like this week, there's a solution here, and you solve it. Uh, so I think that's something really special about this community and what is attracted, and there's an energy around that, and that, that circles, and that builds on each other, and that's why we all keep running into each other again and again. We all have said the word, Eric Kennedy, 35 <laughs> times, because that guy is a stirrer of the energy, and he, he, he might not even realize it or, or, or know it, but there's there's people like that, that uh, the, I think Barrett, Mayor Barrett always says, like, a city is a living organism, and this pandemic has accelerated so much, both virtually, 
um, socially, racially, all these things have come to the forefront. At the same time, there's a mass exodus of, in Milwaukee, we call them uh, maybe the, 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 the glass ceiling. There's a lot of retiring happening right now. There's a massive opportunity that we all are going to see uh, that maybe has not been leaked yet because the, the pandemic is just getting over. But um, the bridge to us was always meant to be more than a bridge. And I think we're all coming at a time right now uh, when so much of society is being accelerated and Milwaukee is very much ripe for change and these conversations like this are those starters of change and I remember uh, meeting Carol right when you moved here you were at an Airbnb living in a friend's house who introduced us you have to meet this new lady she's a president of Milwaukee uh, magazine and you said that day we're gonna we're gonna do something unique we're gonna go have in-depth conversations because a lot of people I don't know about most of you but I could not have underwritten the sponsorship of this, uh, which means you went out and found the unifiers and community organizers here, which is not often done. Normally it's people whose names are on buildings and we've got the sponsorship figured out because of the speaker panel and what you're doing here is authentic community building and integration and the sponsors that have stepped up and said, I'm gonna put my name on that, are attracted to that and wanna fund that. And I think coming out of the pandemic, we're gonna see more and more of that because of leadership like this. So thanks Thank for putting you. this all together. So within, the, within the mental health world, and I know that you guys didn't talk about this, but um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about this. But when we think about, we sometimes we think about the home bridge. Uh, it is oftentimes a spot where people take their last, their, their last breath, their, their last, they're in a very desperate place. And it, it, it was known as something different before it was lit up. And so oftentimes we do talk about, and we do need them. We need, we need the people who build bridges. But we also need the people who light bridges. And I think that that, that call to really light these bridges and make sure that they're lit, we, how can we go from places of darkness into light? How can that be what Milwaukee is all about? How can we go from this place where we have gone through all of this history and this pain? How can we be, we be better at listening to pain and understanding and doing something about it? So I, I thank you all for the work that you all do. And Vidal, you you started off by, by talking about, you know, just kind of... Uh, how sometimes we get into these conversations and it seems like it seems like the world is on fire. It seems like there's so much that's going wrong. But everyone up here is a joyous person. Everyone up here embodies life and joy and happiness. So I think just just you know one of the last things before we go to Q&A is what is one thing that you can one thing that you hope that people in the audience today do as a result of this conversation? Man, this is Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, put me on the spot. <laughs> Financing and access to it, we absolutely know what we're doing. Meaning those who do the work, we know what we're doing. We know why we're doing it. We know who needs help. We know how to help. But often, the people like me, who didn't know enough when I was young enough, to understand how to jump the hurdles, uh, build credit, build uh, a rapport, uh, build business plans and these things. I, my major was fine arts. Now I'm a, a teacher for youth, I'm an <laughs> adjunct professor, I'm a developer, I'm a motivational speaker. <laughs> I'm the dude they see at the gas station and can ask a question about, like, what's going on in the neighborhood? So. We need access to real financing. We need access to real resources because we know what we're doing. We have the education, we do the studies. We are the studies. We are the people. That's what I meant when I said my first comment. I, I know what hunger feels like. I ain't gotta read about it. I know the kids, I know their parents, I know their aunts, their uncles, their cousins that's messing up right now and why they're messing up right now. 
we just need more resources. That's like as blatant as that could be. We we know what we're doing well. Like y'all know me, and I'm up here, and I do the work I do, and I'm doing it out of money I made from jobs, contracts. Imagine if I had a trust when I was born. <laughs> Milwaukee would be changed right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Katie, same thing. Uh, one thing that you hope that that, that we kind of leave with uh, tonight. Yeah, I mean, I I think let's give Adele and me a trust. No, <laughs> uh, um, no, I think. All good trust. Yeah, we can all all of us <laughs> good trust. Um, no, um, I think it's about. But in that, I I really agree with that. Like, I think you know, a lot of this work is yeah from the ground from the ground or below the ground, <laughs> from the basement of the basement, uh, working up, right? Um, and not, and, and figuring it out and just be, and, and having hope that it will all figure out, uh, it'll all get figured out and it somehow does, um, but barely sometimes. And that, and I think that like, what I, what I hope that people kind of walk away is like thinking about how are we really, yeah, how are we sharing resources how are we create opening, not just opening doors, but holding doors open and calling out to everyone and to like, come on in. Um, I just say this on every panel I go on, so I'm gonna say it on this one too. The, the, the myth of white supremacy is that we all have to compete and that there's not room for everyone on us on the top. But what I have seen with like Luna and like lots of and lots of the other work that has been showcased here and, and not here is that there is so much more room if we work together and we make space. So yeah. So I hope Yeah, so I hope that everyone just like sort of like leaves and figures out how can they make space and again like not waiting for it to happen but to like really um yeah don't be lazy go out and like figure out how to make space and like let's not uh like keep this yeah let's like forget that old like c competition is great it's not. <laughs> it's not and also it's just so much more fun to do it with your friends <laughs> so make some friends too there you go there you go um i would say invest in the communities financially um Go beyond the performative. Um, take a chance to look at the structures and push yourself to think about different ways that are that are inclusive. Bring in the partnerships and pay those people that are going to be helping you to think further and be innovative because they can't do it for free all the time. <laughs> That's right. Um, I would I would say I mean I grew up watching Oprah. I used to race home from school <laughs> to sit in front of the TV and watch Oprah. So I'm always thinking about like, why am I doing things, yeah. and um, why am I reacting the way that I react? Why do my why does my friend group look the way that it does? And I just think I'm just looking in this room and thinking about all of the influence and power that each of us have in different ways, and maybe it's workplaces or you you know you influence who gets promoted or hired or what funds get distributed, where all of us have different influence. And I just encourage all of us to continue to think about why we are doing what we're doing. And if it's reflective of our community and the inclusive community that we all say that we want. In those quiet moments when I'm by myself, I constantly think about, you know, why are all my friends black? <laughs> you know, and what you know what schools do I want my kids to go to and why and what do I want their friend groups to look like and who am I eating lunch with at at work and like what restaurants do I go I mean I think I think about every everything and a lot of the things that we're doing is because it's been ingrained in us and we have to remember we live in a segregated community and that's going to get on you you know and the only way that we can fix it if we think about and continue to think about what we're doing and use our influence and force inclusion through our own behavior. Make sure that we are, you know, when you're recommending somebody for opportunities, 
when you're about to write a check. I mean, think about why are you continuing to do the things that you're doing and if it reflects what you say you care about. Because all of us have so much more power than we think we do. And if we all start thinking differently, I think we'll see you know, swaths of our community like re rehashed and changed just because we're making different decisions every day. So that would just be my call. I do it myself and I think if we all did, a lot of our decisions would be different. Miosha. Um, I would say like the one thing I would want everybody to take back is just like take care of yourself and remember that there's somebody else trying to take care of themselves too. Like mm. be kind to yourself, be kind to others and mm. let's move together. I'm like the fifth one to go and I still don't have a really good answer. <laughs> and like I I don't know what I would say to all of you, but I feel like I kind of know what I'd say to myself five years ago or myself 10 years ago, which is that I think it's really easy to sit there and look up at the stage and think like, oh, those people did that or they had the confidence. I think, you know, one of you said the word confidence. And when I was back in the green room, like, at least some of us were confident, but some of us were really joking about not feeling confident. And, you know, I feel not confident all the time. And look at some, what are we going to do? I don't know. Mimi, what are we going to do about this? And we go, I don't know. And so I know how often people say to me, like, oh, you do that work, and that's so, that's so beautiful, or that's so fantastic. And it's nice. Like, that, it's a, that's a really nice thing to say to me. And I think it's a really easy way to distance yourself, too. And like, okay, but what, what can you do? without that. Because not I, I don't know what I'm I can't speak for everybody else, but I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Often oftentimes when we give advice we're speaking to ourselves five years ago anyways. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's all right. Ian doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> he's the thinking it. Uh, I, I guess the, the takeaway I, I think that there's been uh, so many amazing themes and, and points made here tonight. Uh, find the one that resonates most with you and tell someone about it tomorrow or later tonight. Or uh, tell someone about it the next time someone's talking shit about Milwaukee, right? <laughs> um, so I think I, I like to say that we have a little bit of an Eeyore attitude in Milwaukee where we get so caught up in the challenges that we face. And, and it's not to dismiss those challenges, but it's to start to approach them with an attitude of that we can solve them together um, and to not get down on our city. Because the second we start to get down on our city, then we can't fix these things. And so I think all of you know, our colleagues here are, are uh, shining examples of people who have stepped up and said, I want to do something to fix it. And so I think those stories need to be told outside of this room. So I hope you'll, you'll share them. Those are all fantastic. I was thinking as I'm sitting up here, fun. All the little connections in the room. I met so and so. So from from who and who and we mentioned Eric Kennedy before. So I guess in, in final thoughts, some of the things that have been most impactful for me is when someone connects to people. So think about your network and think about I. You know what these these people should know each other because that's where really beautiful things happen and powerful things happen when a mutual connection says, you know what, there's something here. Uh, I've had some of my most interesting, awesome, unique experiences from meeting people that way and some of my best lifelong friends that way as well. And I, I got involved with Fuel right away when I moved here. The amount of people in the network and the spider web that all grew out of there and ideas come when great people collide. And I think every one of us here, in their network, very close to them, has two people that need to collide. And mm -hmm. go do that. That's just a text message. Make that happen. Can we do a couple questions? Sure. sure. We, um, that was great. All of you. Pardeep. All of you.
there's so many takeaways. I can't, you know, we're live streaming this. I can't wait to watch it again tomorrow and write things down. Um, we, we're almost at 9 o'clock, but I want to give the opportunity. If anyone has a question, we're just going to take one or two. Katie's going to come over, and maybe that microphone works. We don't know. All right, I don't have a question. I have a PR campaign already. It's uh, called Make Space. That is the campaign we're going to build around. Obviously, it has so many connotations when I think of what's going on uh, with uh, Ukrainian uh, population being displaced and a certain business. I won't give them a plug, but they're offering a safe haven housing for hundreds of thousands of them. That's called making space. So there are some things that we can all do. And I love Corey's message about uh, connections and influence. We always preach that at Aon through our colleagues that every decision you should make should have an inclusive, inclusive question. Am I impacting somebody that would not be considered in this transaction? So open space. I like that. There you go. Anyone else? Question, comment? All right. I wear that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming, and, and thank you, 2022 Unity Award honorees. You are an inspiration, and I am feeling very humble to just be on the stage with you. Thank you. for coming. We'll do it again next year. Have a great night. Safe home. <laughs>